Like Lisa was saying, uh, I thought I was being smart by being five minutes away in my hotel, and then when I got here, it took about ten minutes to walk around the space to find here, so maybe not so smart. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about today about thermohydrolysis, a little bit about the background, where it's come from, why we do it, what it does, uh, the current configurations and where the marketplace is moving towards. So I guess uh, if you look at thermohydrolysis, like the dinosaurs, there are kind of um, three distinct eras of thermohydrolysis. So if I start off here, um, well, it doesn't quite fit, but on, on, if you could see it, that's 26, there's 1926, which is the year of a patent which was for steam explosion of cellulosic materials to make it more biodegradable. So if you consider that as kind of year zero, and the first work in thermohydrosis from 1941, when there was some guy probably in a shed in the north of England, uh, pressure cooking sewage while the rest of Europe was at war. Um, he found out that if you pressure cook sewage with steam injection for half an hour, it actually dewatered to about 50 to 60 percent dry solids. And then, so a lot of the emphasis in those days was looking only at dry solids of raw sludge cake uh, for downstream processing. Uh, he wrote a second paper, he waited 10 years for results, it's pretty slow going this guy. In 1951 he presented data which showed the dewaterability of different sludges with thermal hydrolysis. Uh, in the late, in the mid 60s there's a lot of work done in Wales and in the early 70s it was, everything was about dewaterability. No one really cared or was interested in AD or biogas. Until, until this happened, the oil crisis in 1973 uh, suddenly everyone's interested. If you look at the literature, uh, there's a lot of literature in advanced digestion coming out in the mid-70s onwards. And there people were starting to look in Stanford and other places. Let's see what happens when you pressure cook sewage and then how much renewable energy, if you are, can we make out of that. So that was kind of from 1975 to 94. Then the third era, as I call that the commercial era, that's where you've got commercial operation of these plants. This is not, you know, uh, lab or pilot scale anymore. These are fully operated facilities. And now we're moving into the kind of the newer configurations. A lot of these are looking more actually thermally hydrolyzing sludge which has already been digested. Uh, I put Chertsey up here because I think Chertsey is a very significant plant in terms of when we look at thermal hydrolysis. There it is here. It's Thames water plant. And really without the success of that plant we wouldn't be so I wouldn't be here talking to you about thermohydrosis. Uh, up until that point, there were several plants in Europe. Uh, Chertsey wasn't working very well. I remember going to a conference and Thames Water said, we built one of these, it was useless, never again. Um, now they have eight. And I suggested to Thames Water, I was in London last week, um, that there's this English heritage thing where you, know, you get a plaque if something famous has happened there. Um, considering... <laughs> Considering thermal hydrolysis in store capacities, nearly half of the UK sludge is thermally hydrolyzed. Uh, I think that's a very significant thing. I mentioned it in terms of water, we'll see what they do. Um, so why, why do we pressure cook sewage? I mean, it's pretty extreme when you think about it. Um, for me, it's, there's only one reason you do it. I've heard of many, many reasons, but the main reason is you are changing the sludge, the rheology of the sludge at a fundamental level. Uh, it's a non-reversal reduction in viscosity. So if I heat something like oil in a pan, the viscosity drops. If I cool it back down again, the viscosity remains to where I started from, but not with sludge. Uh, you know, I, I can heat it up, I can cool it back down, the viscosity will remain about 30 to 40% lower than it was. And that's because there's some materials in their proteins which are denatured and physically broken down by the temperature uh, and they change in, in substance, if you will. So, yeah, I could take a thick sludge and it behaves like a thin sludge. And the reason this is a big deal is it means I can pump it, I can mix it a lot easier than I could before. So now I can feed my digesters at twice the dry solids. Uh, and the dewaterability, going back to my previous slides, is significantly improved. So if I have a new site, I have half the digesters, I, I only need to build half the digesters, so there's a big capital saving there. And my sludge cake production, my biosolids is significantly less. Uh, for me, that, that's the reason you do thermal hydrolysis. Things like 
it's sterilized, it's class A, there's no regrowth, uh, better VS destruction, it's friable material, lowest carbon footprint. For me, these are secondary benefits. You certainly, I don't think you would install it for any of those reasons. You install it because of the capital savings in uh, digestion and the cake reduction. The rest are kind of a bonus. I, I hope so. Uh, let's have a look. Let's try again. Uh, okay. So it works. So this is um, dewatered sludge cake around about 80% dry solids, kind of like um, Frankfurters or something. I don't and then, then this is what it comes looks like when it comes out thermal hydrolysis. Digestive sludge is typically around about 6% solids. But you see how liquid it is for the dry solids content. And importantly, the material that comes off, if you've been to any plants and seen the cake, it's kind of like a soil consistency, which means you can use existing infrastructure, farming infrastructure to, to, to spread the material. Um, it's not a new technology. These are just, uh, from a Canby perspective, these are Canby facilities, uh, 56 of those. The blue ones are in operation, the green ones are in design. But if you look more globally, there are 90, 90 installations, it looks like a Portuguese or something, and there are 90 installations now, above 90. From what I've been hearing, it's probably close to 100, to be honest. Uh, and the main places where they're installed is the UK has 22 um, and the reason the UK has so many is cost, is ho lowest whole life cost so very heavily financially regulated system these are companies on the stock exchange with shareholders for them it's money or regulation so you have a catnap technology in the UK which is cheapest available technology narrowly avoiding prosecution is the, uh, is the mentality of UK water companies uh, and the other place, you can't see it there, but it's China. There's uh, probably about 20 installations in China already. Um, and the main driver there is environmental. It's uh, carbon footprint reduction. It's the main concern. Even in uh, North America, I say there's one plant in South America. There are 10. These are just Canby projects. There are 10 projects in North America. There's also uh, Veolia have a project uh, in Denver with a pilot plant looking at thermal. So there's a lot of this already in a short period of time. So what does it do? Well, if we start to heat sludge up, we start to solubilize readily biodegradable material. So loosely bound extracellular material starts to be solubilized. I increase the temperature, um, then I can start to solubilize more tightly bound material. So it's mainly carbohydrates at this stage is what I'm releasing with temperature. If I keep increasing the temperature, the cells, the bacterial cells collapse and then kind of their entrails, if you will, are, are released, um, pretty gory and all the proteins start to get released at this point. And if I continue to increase the temperature, these proteins start interacting with the carbohydrates and start making higher molecular weight material. And this is a problem because this material is, has color uh, it's non-biodegradable. Um, so the higher the temperature, the better the dewaterability, and the better the biogas production up to a point. And if I keep increasing the temperature, the biogas production will drop because I'm making these higher molecular weight materials. It works best on material with a high protein content. So if you're looking at, say, co-digestion, the higher the protein content, the, the more thermal hydrolysis has an impact then carbohydrates, it has virtually no impact on fat, soils and grease other than sterilization. So the reason why it works better with waste activated sludge is that waste activated sludge has about three times higher protein content than primary sludge. Primary sludge has fat in it that doesn't have much impact. Having said that, the on WAS you can expect about 50 to 60 percent increase in gas production and on primary about a 15 to 20 percent increase. So just some like examples here, so as I increase temperature the viscosity reduces, uh, the dewaterability improves, this is the color here, the color increases with temperature, uh, dissolved organic nitrogen, because that color has carbon in there, it has nitrogen in there, these are things you need to consider. Um, 
and this is the UVA um, you see there for UV disinfection you may have an issue potentially and the, and the gas production you see goes up to a certain temperature and then levels off uh, you can have a copy of the slides after the presentation but for me this shows the impacts of thermal hydrolysis on anaerobic digestion the main impacts of these blue boxes I think it does six fundamental things uh, the first one there you can't read obviously is uh, it I can't even read it on here is it destroys extracellular polymers and this has a very big impact on dewaterability uh, this is why if you, if you thermally hydrolyze raw sludge it dewaters very well when you digest the extracellular polymers are reformed and then this interferes with dewatering so this has a big impact the second one is it increases solubility this increases biodegradability more biogas on the positive on the negative it makes more proteins, puts more proteins in solution these interact with polymer which may increase your pollen demand so it's not you know, all, all good decreased particle size, uh, improves mass transfer, improves um, biodegradability decreases viscosity, allows higher loading rates which puts more nitrogen into the system um, destroys foam causing organisms Although they're aerobic, they can go to have a nice nap in the digestion and not killed. They just have a sleep, but they can't handle temperatures above 70 degrees C. And then obviously it sterilizes the sludge. Um, but the problem is, um, when we look at the textbooks, uh, you know, just let's make off an idiot. They just throw it out the window because everything we know about thermal hydrolysis and digestion is, is different from the textbooks because they were written a long time ago so when you thermally hydrolyze sludge it has a different viscosity it has different bulk density the sludge is twice as concentrated it's more biodegradable but yet we still design digestion downstream as if it was none of those things we still di design digesters at 20 days um, textbooks, if you look at the, the, the equation, uh, is actually from a WEF report from 1973. Um, but last week in London, I was at a conference, thermal hydrosis with digestion is better, actually better suited to lower retention times, around about 10 days. Longer retention times in, increase the protein concentration. Bigger headspace, you have a problem with the rapid rise. If you design for a lower bulk density, you can design that out in the, when you design the digesters. They prefer high operating temperatures, around about 104, 105 Fahrenheit. And the ammonia toxicity doesn't seem to be as big a deal as is previously expected. Thames Water, I found out last week, operating digest at 48 C which is neither thermophilic nor mesophilic but it's very high ammonia concentration no problem there's a plant in Brussels which is ironically it's a Veolia owned Canby plant which digests at 13.5% dry solids prior to wet air oxidation and the, and the dry solids coming out is at 8% uh, so typically this is where it's been so when you look at the reference list it's been we have co-settled sludge we pressure cook it and digest it. Um, hopefully this, this should work. So what happens specifically with a, the, the canby and the, say the, the Veolia system is you thicken the sludge as much as you can on the left hand side here. That goes into a, a vessel here, a pulp of vessel it's called. And then under pressure, everything's moving there under pressure so there's no pumping it within that system. So then it's pressure cooked for half an hour in one of these vessels and then that's rapidly decompressed from about 6, 7 bar uh, times 14.1 psi uh, almost to atmospheric pressure here uh, at 200 Fahrenheit. So you get a steam explosion there. So it's like taking your bacteria to the bottom of the ocean and then taking them to the surface and they, and they explode with the heat and you get explosion so this is some of the innovation is more to do with um, optimizing the design and the installation so this this plant here will treat 80 dry tons each each of the reactors is about 20 dry tons and so you can put in as many as you want so that's per train you can have multiple ones of these 
Um, it's kind of like a giant Lego set. It's all built off-site. Comes in boxes that you that you uh, erect on site. Um, takes about six months to build. About six weeks to be fully operational once it comes on. Uh, this is a plant in Holland, in the Netherlands. Uh, just to give you an idea, it's a bit dark, um, of the installation. This is a 40 dry ton system here. You can see here the walkways will come in a moment. Looks like English summertime there with all dark clouds. Um, so th this plant here was uh, mechanically installed in three days uh, after the after the material arrived on site, the, the components, and it was up and running um, a couple of weeks after that. It's kind of pre-wired, so you connect the wiring uh, on site. Um, here, typical sludge and water balance. You can see how much. The thickness of the lines tells you the quantity, so you can see how much you've got coming in on the left and how little is actually coming out on the right. To give you an idea, of concept is about less than 5% of what goes in comes out when you're looking at the water side. So, first thing you do is, as I mentioned, you thicken the sludge and dewatering first. And the reason is the energy balance, because the thicker the material, the less energy I need to heat it up. Ideally, you can go you go as high as you can. However, to go as high as you can, you dewater that. You dewater it needs polymer. Dewatering needs energy. You have viscosity issues there. If you have a was only system, was only system, I know you'd be able to dewater that well to begin with. So, so you need to consider these aspects. But ideally, as thick as you can get away with. And then, and this is, see the second dilution water goes in. So it's coming out at this stage about 14% because the steam has diluted the sludge. Uh, and then you dilute it again. And the reason you dilute it again is this graph here is, is the free ammonia. This is considered toxic in digestion. Free ammonia between pH of 7 and pH of 8 goes up by 500% in relative terms. So potentially the digesters, you know, having a lot more ammonia toxicity. As I said before, there's more and more research showing that it's not such a big deal. Um, so if we look at the energy balance, so this is the same part, 100 dry tons per day. Uh, again, the thickness of the line there is the energy. You can see here the energy coming out of the biogas is around about, well you can't see, <laughs> it's tiny, is, is 11 megawatts and we need about um, 25% of that to meet the steam demand if I don't have any cogen. So rule of thumb is 25% of the energy in the gas I need for the thermal hydrolysis. If I do have cogen though, I can recover a lot of that energy back as high grade heat. So it's normally around about an equivalence of between 5 to 10% of the biogas production I make I need in this configuration uh, for the energy, which is the main downside of that type of So, as I mentioned, you can have these slides afterwards, but the main difference is here, you see the loading rates, typically two to three times higher with thermal hydrolysis. BS destruction is typically 20 to 25, 20 to 30 percent higher, depending on the sludge type and composition. Uh, the pH in the digester is running higher because I have more biosolids in there, more protein is released. Uh, that increases the pH. So pH is around about 8. Um, and the dry solids, rule of thumb, whatever you get before thermal hydrolysis, you'll get 10 percentage points better afterwards. So if I'm getting 20%, I'll get 30 uh, on the whole. Uh, and the ammonia concentration is obviously much higher because it's concentrated, but the loading rate is only 20 to 30 percent higher. It's the same as the gas production, um, and it's class A versus not. So this is a slide from United Utilities, it's a daily Hume project, which is uh, a project which produces class A cake to land or liquid that goes on a pipeline to an incinerator where it's dewatered as class B or it's burnt. 
Um, these were the, like the commissioning test results. And this is pretty typical of a thermal hydrolysis plant in the UK, very high gas production, around about four, 450 cubic meters per ton of dry, metric ton of dry solids going in. Um, what they've done there is they, they preheated the sludge prior to the thermal hydrolysis, so they managed to get the uh, parasitic load down to 4% biogas equivalents, which is actually twice as good as the guarantee was given. And it's actually the highest generator of renewable energy in the UK. It's generating um, between 9 and 10 megawatts of electricity from 370 US dry tons uh, using engines, not using turbines. Blue planes you know about, this is designed at 450, but sees probably closer to maybe 320 dry tons per day. So six months to start the facility up. And the current performance, again, it's a, this is DC water data. I say low to mid 60% VS destruction. Belt pressure water, maybe 31, 32% on the belt. Uh, cake production before was lime, so the cake, there's no digestion, lime was added. About 1,200 wet tons, it's now about 450. Polydose 20 pounds, uh, so that depends, it can go up, it can go down. And interestingly, the cake exceeds composting requirements except for the dry sites. I know DC Water is doing a lot of interesting stuff looking at composting this material, see what where you can take it. But there's no lime in it anymore. So even if you have far, local farmers who are used to lime, there's something you may have to consider. You're changing the sludge properties. Um, for me, the big benefit in terms of energy-wise is not in the biogas. It's when you have dryers or you have incineration downstream. Um, if you look here, this is like the energy and water balance for drying one wet ton of raw sludge at 25% to 90%. So you can see the brown there is, is the sludge and the blue is the water. So in that instance, I need to remove nearly three tons of water. If I digest that, just normal digestion, some of that solids material, instead of going to dry, is now converted to biogas, so I have less material going in. And so I've got about a third less water evaporation. All the energy in drying is all in evaporating the water. If I improve the VS destruction further and I improve the dewatering, I have less material going into the dryer with less water in it. And now I'm about, I've dropped from nearly three tons of water to one ton of water for equivalent amount of uh, drying. So this has been seen on many full-scale applications where dryers have been shut down altogether or massively reduced in what they need to do. So it's typically about between 45 and 60% less energy required for drying. This example here in China, the, the dark blue here is the biogas production um, from, from the digester and the light blue is after you've used the biogas for drying. Okay, so you, for example, you could see thermal hydrolysis. This, is, this instance is about a third more gas. Um, but because I have less material, I need less of that gas to dry. Because and then, so in the end, basically, cutting a long story short, when I have digestion, I need about 80% of my energy for drying. When I have thermal hydrolysis, I need about a third of that energy. More biogas than I use less of uh, an example here, seven, uh, Northumbrian Water is the biggest drying plant in Europe. Um, seven dryers, uh, five tons of water evaporation each. Uh, most of the product was going to farmland as dry material. Um, gas, gas by they were using 17 and a half megawatts of gas, which when you run the numbers is about 1.35 megawatts per ton. Theoretically, it's 0.7. Uh, accounting for inefficiencies should be about one, so it tells you how inefficient those dryers were. Uh, electricity, they're using two megawatts, uh, 30 kilowatts per kilogram water. Maintenance upgrades, these are all the kind of issues they were facing. Carried a sludge strategy review. So they, they put in a thermal hydrolysis plant, now they generate 4.7 megawatts, and their gas demand went from 17 and a half down to one and a half. And we see this on, on many facilities. 
This is another impact of thermohydrosis is regrowth in sudden odors. Um, as you know, it's the famous Worth study, looking at MAD uh, variants of uh, biological hydrolysis, thermohydrolysis, temperature phase digestion, even 70 degree C pasteurization. And only the plant Anasis Island, the stage thermophilic digestion and thermal hydrolysis didn't give any regrowth or odors in the, in the cake in the study they did. Um, carbon footprints, if you consider what it does, you have the highest volatile solids destruction, which means you have the highest renewable energy generation. You have less material, so you're transporting and moving less stuff around. The water's better, so there's less water in there, so if I have dryers or incinerators, I'm using less energy, fewer chemicals for gas cleanup. Less sludge again, less transport. Higher standard of treatment, which may mean I don't need to travel as far in my truck, I can find more outlets closer by. And as you can imagine, you combine all of those aspects together, even with the parasitic steam demand, you end up with the lowest uh, carbon footprint when you're looking at op optimal solutions. So quickly going to configurations, depends on the drivers really. So I've been talking about the standard thermohydrosis upstream. It's good if you want to save money on digesters and you want class A, but, but the downside is this auxiliary fuel demand. So what you can do is, because it works better on WAS than on primary sludge, you can just look at the WAS. The plant is half the size, the energy balance is far better but now it's not class A anymore. Um, and you have problems with viscosity. This is a main, this on, in an Excel spreadsheet looks very easy to do. Uh, it's not, in, re in real life there are a lot of problems with viscosity with WAS only. Um, then you can thermally hydrolyze digested sludge. So I can do it on one site where I digest, have a smaller plant, I keep my class A and then I digest again. Or do what Thames Water does is where they digest on one facility put it in a truck and instead of going as class B to land they take it to another plant where they have thermohydrosis and digest it again or you can do going back to old school going back to as a dewatering aid do the thermohydrosis downstream of digestion uh, to, to take advantage of the dewatering aspect so this is a standard one I've been talking about so far if we look at the WAS only, there are seven of these, three are, three are operational. Um, but there's WAS and there's WAS. This is from David Batchstone in Queensland Uni. Not all WAS is the same. So the longer the sludge age, the less biodegradable it is. And we've got all these like exotic WAS now. Um, that a lot of information isn't known about those. So this is something you still have to consider. The WAS is very, very different. If we look at the energy balance there, on the left hand side is the thermal hydrosis of everything, on the right hand side only the WAS. You can see on the left hand side I, I generate 4 megawatts, on the right it's only 3.5 so I lose a bit of generation. However my steam demand has gone from 2.8 megawatts down to 1.1. So I don't even need the auxiliary fuel anymore so I meet my fuel demand. This is actually the first plant in the Americas continent, um, in Chile. Uh, this is a, a big uh, 75 dry tons per day WAS only. So the WAS is thermally hydrolyzed and then re-blended back with unthermally hydrolyzed primary sludge immediately prior to digestion. One of the benefits I haven't mentioned yet is you get rid of your cooling system because you you're using the sludge to cool. You're cooling the, the thermally hydrolyzed WAS with, with the primary sludge. So that's another capital cost saving. <clears throat> this one, this uh, was a presentation just a couple of days ago in London by the client on this. This is in Athens in Greece. Uh, <laughs> it looks like a nice holiday destination there in the middle of the Mediterranean. Um, <clears throat> this is a WAS only, exactly the same as before, the same benefits. But this is interesting because they have a dryer. Um, they were dewatering to about 21-22% dry solids before. Now they're dewatering to 32%. That graph in the top left-hand corner is the before and after thermohydrosis dewaterability. 
which means that their drying plant downstream, half of it's been shut down, their, their gas demand has gone down by nearly 50%. So you can see that's a big cost benefit if you have drying. Um, <clears throat> intermediate, so here we digest, we thermally hydrolyze and digest again. You get additional benefits because now you're digesting in, in series. So you get more biogas anyway because you've got stage digestion. But now you've got the thermohydrosis in between. Typically, you'll see if here you get about 65% VS destruction compared to WAS only, which is 55, and TH of everything upstream, which is about 59. The dewatering is normally about three percentage points better. If you, if you go for this configuration compared to normal thermal hydro. And then you have the solid stream. Yeah. Th this is the one where it's all a bit weird. Um, <coughs> so weird, in fact, um, it's kind of like entering the twilight. Everything you know about sludge treatment, you basically forget uh, in, this, in this instance. So you have to keep biosolids in a digester, that's why you do recuperative thickening, where in this case it's the opposite. You take the sludge out, you send the liquid back. You can't dewater hot because the polymer is degraded. Here you're dewatering at 85 degrees Celsius, 85 to 90 degrees C. VS destruction, you can't go above 70, well yes you can. You're intentionally making dirty centrate with colloidal material in it because that's what you want to send back in the digestive because that's where the energy is so you're dewatering it badly on purpose in terms of capture material uh, taking COD levels, putting it in an anaerobic digestive for three days and digesting it <coughs> dewatering at above 40% on centrifuge intentionally messing up your plant uh, to make it perform differently um, so that's what it looks like there, that's the layout so you digest the, the ammonia which can cause a problem is pulled out in the first dewatering stage, goes through the solid stream which is slightly differently designed and configured, dewatered again, the cake comes out as your final product, the dirty liquid goes back into your digester which reduces your retention time by about 25 This is Ampa uh half an hour outside of Munich. It's the plant going in. You can see the configuration on the left, it's only because of space. It's not normally designed like that, they just pulled the silo out and it fits where a silo used to be. Uh, similar as before, you have a pulper, reactor flash tank, you have a barometric egg now because you don't want to be pumping too much because pumping reduces the temperature, temperature reduces dewaterability. Um, and you've got dewatering centrifuge there with air extraction on the so this is what it normally looks like if you went for it. Um, it's specifically designed for high ash sludge, so it's not actually a normal thermohydrosis design. It's designed to, to have as little pumping as possible. Um, and the cooling, odor extraction as well, is from 18.9 to 9.6. So I'm getting over half of the sludge heating by bringing that centrate back. So this is what it looks like. Um, having seen it, it's actually different to thermally hydrolyzed material. It has a different feel about it. It's like a coffee grind. Um, when you squeeze it in your hand, it, it falls through your hand. It's very friable. And it composts in storage as well. Um, but the problem so far is it's not class A uh, because class A vector attraction has to happen at the same time or before here it's happening at the same time and after. So strictly speaking it's not class A, so there's a challenge there. So this material looks like this. They're dewatering it to between 38 and 44% dry solids depending on the poly dose. Dewatered to about 35% without polymer. Um, but the client is very concerned to take risks with their plant that they don't want to take. 
And then this is another plant, this is, uh, this is another technology, high dry solids. So this is using a dynamic mixer, this is like the Veolia system, the Excellus if you will. Um, there's a couple of plants there, the white ones are next year, the, the two on the right are prototypes. But the idea in here is you use a dynamic mixer to have a higher dry solids to reduce your steam demand, which is the main issue of thermal hydrolysis. But then you still have to dilute the sludge downstream anyway because you can't digest uh, high dry solids. There's about 10 to 40 tons of dry solids per, per system, four reactor sizes. But the installed is between 12 and 30. For the normal thermal hydrolysis, the installed size is between 10 and 450. And that's been operating now for a year or two. Again, there's maybe issues there with the class A because it's continued. So to conclude, for me, thermal hydrolysis does many things, but the thing it does is the reason you buy it is because it changes the rheology of the sludge. This is the main reason. And this has knock-on impacts on, on what you do and how much money you spend in your plant. It's a mature technology. It's been around since the 1940s, if you look at the literature. Uh, certainly, it's been in operation since 1995 for the first time full scale. That plant is still in operation. It's recently up, gone an upgrade because they've got more sludge now. Um, it's not in Antarctica. It's the only continent it isn't in. It's in uh, every other continent. Uh, and, and we're looking at the issues with thermal hydrolysis, trying to address those. So looking at the parasitic energy demand, looking at other issues with colour, I've not touched too much. And a shift towards uh, looking at digested sludge to extract even more value from the sludge as before. So with that, thank you for your time. Thank you. Yes, yeah, sorry. Was so loquacious. Sorry. Today. But uh, if uh, why don't you all stand up for just a second? Because I, I know.